Welcome to the Compact Podcast. Today we'll discuss the new Dune film, attempts to ban TikTok, and the latest scandal of the British Royals photoshopping disaster that has shaken the kingdom to its foundations. I'm joined by Sarah Amari, Nina Power, and Jeff Schulenberger, and I'm Matthew Schmitz. So there's a bipartisan effort in Congress, and this is a rare, real bipartisan effort. Um, there are occasionally kind of uh, ostensibly bipartisan efforts where there's one party behind a bill and a few members of another party. This one has really broad bipartisan support. Joe Biden has said he'll sign it. It's a, it's a bill that would uh, ban TikTok in the United States unless ByteDance, the uh, Chinese firm, sells its stake in the company. Uh, to some American group. Uh, this isn't the first bill to ban TikTok. There was one proposed a couple of years ago. Uh, that earlier bill had some you know, disturbing civil liberties implications, even for kind of users of foreign-owned or foreign-controlled social media platforms. This one doesn't have any penalties for uh, U.S. users of you know, foreign controlled platforms, but it has encountered some pushback. It's encountered pushback from hedge fund figures who have financial interest in ByteDance, the Chinese firm. Uh, and it has also been opposed uh, most recently and uh, surprisingly to some by Donald Trump, who uh, was behind previous efforts to ban TikTok. Jeff, um, are you a TikTok user? And, uh, and where do you come down on this? I, I am not. I have only seen TikToks sort of indirectly through their being posted on Twitter. Um, I have long been struck by, you know, in a sense, the national security implications of having, you know, what's what's often described as algorithmically the most powerful of the, the social media platforms to to have developed yet. And everybody I know who uses it confirms this. Uh, you know, there is something incredibly powerful about about the algorithm that's been developed for this and it it's it's so it is a remarkable fact that it is a kind of state-owned company in effect i mean at least partly by a, a power that you know would would seem to be increasingly hostile it's also notable that you know looking in the other direction of course china uh itself bans you know basically all foreign social media um, you know, if you go there, you have to use a virtual private network to access, you know, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. So, you know, I, I think uh, this this sort of, uh, and we've published a few pieces that speak to this, uh, you know, one by Michael Toscano, The Case for Banning TikTok, another by Batia Ungar Sargon, The TikTok and the um, Decline of Neoliberalism, I think. You know, both of which kind of touch on the fact that for a long time, you know, any kind of uh, crackdown of the sort would seem to make us, uh, you know, uncomfortably similar to a place like China, right, which which uh, restricts uh, social media platforms. But that seems to be, as you know, as Badia argued, it, and and as this recent um, legislation suggests, there seems to be a you know more and more of a bipartisan consensus that uh, you know there there is uh, you know that that a kind of just uh, naive ideology of free of sort of consumer freedom around these things is dangerous, and we need to actually think more judiciously about um, you know what the public interest is around these these types of technologies. And so, you know, it, it does seem that the conversation has evolved. And I think overall, that's good. You know, it's, it's also worth noting, as people often do, that China itself restricts social media use among young people, like quite strictly. So, you know, and, and you've seen people, um, I'd say particularly conservatives, sort of pointing this out. And, you know, I, I think an interesting question. So, so I would say overall, I am, uh, although I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I have a, a clear answer as to what exact um, legislative form and regulatory form this should take. I think the development towards a more a more serious and judicious discussion about the the social effects of these technologies and 
how you know the state might um, might limit, restrict, regulate, etc. Them in order to you know uh, advance other public interests is a good direction, and it's it's better than the sort of neoliberal free for all that prevailed for a long time. I'm sort of curious. I mean, I think you know Trump having come out against it is has largely been framed as in completely cynical terms that he's you know, basically he's been he's he's kind of strapped for cash because he's been subjected to all of this lawfare, um, and he's been approached by uh, a you know major shareholder in in TikTok who uh, you know has kind of won him over to to the opposite position of the one he used to hold. Um, and so I don't I don't know enough to understand that seems kind of plausible to me, but um, you know I can't I can't confidently confirm it. But one interesting thing here is that um, if you know if if Trump does become the major spokesperson to uh, to uh, come out against banning TikTok, it's uh, it will be interesting to see whether this you know basically consolidates liberal punditry on be in favor of banning TikTok, which I think. You know, overall, most of the impetus for social media restriction has so far has occurred in conservative states like Utah, right, which has attempted to restrict social media use. And some, you know, uh, liberal uh, NGOs, nonprofits have pursued uh, lawsuits against these state laws restricting social media. So I'm curious whether this will produce a sort of equal and opposite reaction whereby the liberal punditry decides that, you know, because Trump is now against banning TikTok, they have to be for it. So that'll be an interesting thing to observe. Yeah, in, ter- in terms of Trump's change of opinion, I think the there are two stories. Maybe each one has some truth, but uh, let's let's just uh, lay them out in opposing terms. One is that he he just had a meeting with Jeff Yass, this hedge fund billionaire with a huge stake in ByteDance. Suddenly, his position on TikTok has changed. You do the math. Money talks. The other uh, story. And then the story that Trump himself is is putting out there is that this uh, reflects uh, his basic views and particularly his views as they've evolved since the fall of 2020. Um, all throughout his primary campaign, effectively at all of his rallies, uh, he said, the main threats that America faces aren't external, they're internal. Um, it's not tyranny overseas coming for us. It's threats to, you know, the threats to our country are ones here at home in the American system. That's the problem that we face. Um, So in reference to TikTok, he's, uh, uh, you know, said banning it will empower Facebook. And, you know, Trump says, I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people. What Facebook did with Dropboxes with the 500 million Zuckerbucks, Dropboxes that he put in, I consider illegal. Now, it isn't clear to me why uh, forcing uh, TikTok to be divested of its con- you know, controlling Chinese interests and to be you know, open to Americans would uh, in- increase Facebook's power per se. Also, things have changed since 2020. Uh, Twitter, uh, an influential social media platform, if by no means the most popular, is in the hands of a Trump ally. So I think there are, are some real limits to the story that Trump is telling, but you can at least see how... Th- uh, the 2020 election and the role played in it by social media and by uh, social media moguls may have changed Trump's view of the matter. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about this and Trump's opposition, and I will sound like a like I'm making some convoluted defense of Trump um, that I'm bending over backwards to the point. But I do think that there is a tendency when it comes to big tech reform that the only way the United States can do certain kinds of reforms is by turning the problem into an external threat and or on the part of Republicans making things about like kind of the woke domestic internal threat. Um, Some combination of the two often is the case. I think that seems to be in some of the rhetoric about TikTok. Um, So what I mean by that is like, TikTok is a particularly glaring example of the way in which social media platforms uh, take advantage of especially young minds uh, to addict them, you know, using kind of uh, the all the latest kind of cutting edge research in, in neuroscience to make these apps as addictive as possible. We've all scrolled aimlessly for hours and then thought to ourselves, what exactly was I doing the past couple of hours? What did I 
do other than and then to supply like kind of my own desires into to these companies to then for them to then use that information to advertise to me. So I've participated in a kind of self disclosure to these surveillance technologies, essentially. So TikTok is a is a, is a glaring example of that. But it's TikTok is an easy way to go uh, against uh, this trend because it's a Chinese owned company, and so in very typical American style. We say it's the evil of communist China. The Chinese Communist Party is doing this and that via TikTok, and the risk is the risk is that we lose sight of the fact that lots of domestic companies can engage in the same things.、Uh, in fact, we know that other big term U.S. based TikTok firms do hire,、uh, you know, neurologists, neuroscientists, etc., to make their apps as addictive as possible. If addiction is the problem, the algorithms that determine what you see on any of these apps, whether it's the Chinese-owned one or the American-owned ones, is completely opaque. And、um, it, what it means is that essentially, if there are relatively few oligarchs, exercise a vast amount of control over our. Uh, public debate, so that our public square is this privately owned playground of different oligarchs with their own competing ideologies. So, whether it's、uh, Elon Musk, which a、uh, contributor to our pages,、uh, David Polanski, described as Elon Musk crank playground, you know, it's it's the it's the、um, platform where you go increasingly for like、um, uh, you know really hard right、uh, kind of racial right stuff, or it's Facebook, where you, no political content at all of any stripe can really get through. Try posting about politics about it; it's it's extremely difficult. Or whatever the platform, it doesn't matter what the un- ideology of the oligarch is, including maybe Chinese ideology.、Uh, the problem is that our public space is controlled by oligarchs. Period. And so these kinds of reforms、uh, of targeting just one platform. Could be a distraction for the kind of deeper politicization of、uh, of platform political economies that we need.、Um, so this is the best case, I would argue, for for Trump's posture. That said, on the other side, you could argue, and I'm kind of half persuaded by this, that、um, that going after TikTok is a good start. You know, it it it's the kind of move that.、Um, Makes possible other political possibilities down the road. Well, if we object to TikTok doing this, why don't we object to you know Mark Zuckerberg doing the same thing, making his product addictive, et cetera, et cetera? Or why don't we object to Elon Musk making his product、um, in his own way censorious and so on? So that's the downside of Trump's move: is we may not have any kind of reform.、Um, we were going to get an imperfect one. I I I, th- I think I th- I'm I'm sort of torn between those two positions, but I think what I laid out as the problem of American political culture, which is that whatever the problem, we try to externalize it onto some foreign threat,、uh, and Matthew alluded to this as well, can have real limits, which is that we lose sight of the you know more fundamental political economic problem with tech platforms. So nobody here is on TikTok. No,、nope. uh, dis- disappointed. Well, no. Well, I mean, think of the subscribers we could get if we were out there promoting. No, I I'm not on TikTok, and I I hate Instagram. I I find these things like very very overwhelming. I I think they're like image crack. I think they're responsible for all kinds of social contagion. I personally find images very very powerful, and I think they are very powerful. I think we need to understand them. In Giraudian terms, is inciting mimetic desire. I think we can talk about social contagion, whether it's to do with eating disorders or gender dysphoria or any of these other things that are particularly affecting young people.、Um, you know, it's a complicated question to do with freedom of expression, censorship. But I really think the common good here is is key. Just just to note as an interesting fact, the UK government are banned from、um, using TikTok. Uh, but it's not banned in the country. It is, however, banned in、uh, Nepal. And to go to Jeff's point about the common good, well, a, a position we all share, a, an interest we all share, that the Nepalese、um, uh, minister for communication, whose name is Rekha Sharma, last year he said the following about TikTok. He said it disturbs social harmony and disrupts family structures and social relations. So here you have a country, and we know that Nepal is particularly interested. Like Bhutan in questions of social harmony、uh, and other criteria beyond simply those of GDP,、um, 
freedom of expression, individual rights and, and so on, and all of these other very liberal uh, values. So I think we have to think more coherently, uh, socially, uh, and indeed about the common good, um, as well as these questions about data collection um, and also the possibility of uh, Chinese spying, which is the reason why uh, government ministers in the UK are banned from using TikTok in their governmental positions. Yeah, I I will say I um I think the position, regardless of its motivations, I would say this is kind of the the position Trump is carving out here is in a way the sort of worst side of his politics. I w- I would argue it's um it's ultimately kind of nihilistic. It's like f- parsing the whole you know pol- all the political questions through his sort of personal obsessions with these ideas that, you know, somehow Zuckerberg like rigged the election against him. Um, So, you know, what, what it, what it suggests very disappointingly is yes. I mean, there are criticisms as, as have been articulated about the, the limitedness of this uh, proposed reform and the way that it, it sort of, you know, doesn't uh, assess the, the larger, uh, you know, social effects of, of social media, regardless of, you know, whether a a hostile nation is is a major ownership, um, you know, is is a a major shareholder, um, you know, but nonetheless, this is not, you know, this is not the starting point of some more uh, comprehensive conversation. Instead, it's just a kind of derailing of the whole discussion in favor of of, you know, an ultimately kind of aimless and, and sort of nihilistic politics of just sort of rancor and and uh, bitterness. So, so I can't say I find much, you know, regardless of what the motivations, it, it's, it seems like it's, you know, and it's indicative of the, the um, unlikeliness, unfortunately, of any serious sort of regulatory projects around technology emerging from a second um, Trump administration, because uh, you know, it, it suggests a kind of fundamental unseriousness about these these larger questions we've been raising. So, yeah, that's let, my. Let me... the, this would be uh, w- one of the one of the weaker uh, parts of of Trump's case for himself. I would say. Yeah, let let me uh, emphasize if I haven't enough. Just you know, we faced a lot of unseriousness from the Trump administration, partly a, a, a kind of a product of the man's own erraticness, and partly it's a result of um, uh, the fact that it was its administration is kind of under attack. Its legitimacy was under attack for four years. But yeah, I mean, that kind of same thing could be replicated uh, in a second Trump administration because of what you just put your finger on, Jeff, is that there's, um, you know, so often things just come down to, you know, his personal preferences um, and like whoever spoke to him most recently, including if the person who spoke to him, you know, happened to offer him financial assistance or whatever. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a real problem. I mean, it, cause, because in, in many ways, the current, ref, the current reformist mood, which is in many ways, a bar bipartisan reformist move on a number of things on industrial policy on labor, et cetera, is a product of of the original Trumpian scream of rage that emanated in 2015 and 16. But in terms of like the the serious kind of regulatory reform that it would take to get some of these things done, you have every reason, I think, to be kind of doubtful. Frank Herbert's uh, classic series of novels, Dune, is a touching, progressive-minded affirmation of the importance of strong, independent-minded women breaking free from patriarchy and carving out a space of their own in the cold cosmos. Or so you'd be led to believe if you've watched the new film adaptation of Dune. This, according to Carlos Dengler, who wrote on Dune for Compact in an article titled Dune's Girl Boss Misstep. I haven't seen Dune. Uh, I have four kids, uh, five and under, so maybe I'll get to it. Haven't yet. I think some other people here have been doing their jobs, though, and have seen it and can now talk about it for the benefit of you, the listener. Yeah, you know, beginning with Carlos's uh, piece that just came out this morning, 
you know, I think if, if you look at the film holistically, I mean, he focuses on one, one dimension of it, which I agree with him as kind of the weakest, which is this character, Chani, who's played by Zendaya, um, who's, you know, a, a young woman of, of striking appearance, you know, particularly with the, the sort of dyed blue eyes that, uh, you know, are, are, uh, uh, you know, induced by the the uh, consumption of, of too much spice. But in any case, um, she, you know, is sort of made to embody this kind of uh, guerrilla insert, this sort of desert guerrilla insurgency through this sort of Lawrence of Arabia plot, you know, in which the Timothy Chalamet character, uh, Paul Atreides, who's sort of the, the son of a, of a um, duke who's... Um, you know, who, who has been murdered along with his entire entourage, you know, by these sort of ma imperial machinations. And he joins up with this desert, uh, you know, sort of nomadic insurgent people trying to, to fight the evil empire, you know, that has killed his father. And so the, the you know, part two um, essentially recounts his, his rise through his sort of marshalling of the, the fanatical support of these desert uh, sort of Bedouin type people who, you know, basically uh, through the, through the, uh, uh, the sort of um, a, a long-term project of political manipulation have been led to kind of expect him to occupy the role of Messiah. And so then, you know, so, so I mean, there's much in this political picture, which is ultimately not, not particularly palatable or attractive to, uh, you know, contemporary liberal, liberal viewership. Um, you know, it's it's not a it's it, it ultimately is is quite quite ugly, brutal, um, you know, cloak and dagger politics. Um, but what v Denis Villeneuve, the director, attempts to do to try to um, to try to you know sort of mitigate this somewhat and and give us a more attractive sort of political uh, tendency to to get behind is to create this kind of you know, version of like indigenous, uh, you know, sort of decolonial revolts or rebellion, you know, which is, of course, led by a woman, this Zendaya character who basically, you know, it, once uh, Paul, the Timothy Chalamet character, you know, basically um, effectively challenges the power of the empire and, and, you know, vanquishes his enemies, you know, it's clear that his entire kind of role as a liberator uh, of these people was something of a was something of a farce, much as it had been with Lawrence of Arabia. And then in fact, he, he was, you know, involved in a kind of much, you know, vaster kind of imperial power play. And so at this point, Zendaya's character sort of storms off and, you know, is apparently going to kind of lead her own egalitarian, you know, insurgency against the continued empire. You know, he also betrays her romantically and in favor of a of a, uh, you know, strategic alliance with the daughter of the, the um, sort of decrepit emperor played by Christopher Walken. And so it, it's, it's clearly, a, you know, what I think Dengler's piece points out is this, um, you know, th that the, the overall politics of the film are, you know, quite ruthless rail politique. Um, and, you know, it, it, there, there's not much to, to rescue from it that seems particularly politically attractive. And so a great deal is invested in kind of creating this romance around this rebel insurgency of these, um, you know, these desert people against the, the evil empire. But, you know, as it turns out, um, this, you know, is, is essentially all manipulated by um, you know, a faction of the empire in order to advance its own interests. So it, it sort of creates this compensatory story, you know, whereby it, and, and, and it gives these speeches to um, this character that, you know, everybody take, you know, it's this egalitarian culture of like mutual aid and all this kind of stuff, which, I mean, you don't really see among these, de you know, the, the desert people are basically portrayed as like quite, sort of traditional conservative Muslims. So this idea that there's some kind of egalitarian, um, you know, kind of touchy feely culture, like is actually kind of contradicted by what you, what you see them doing all around. But nonetheless, it's, um, it's sort of put in there to try to give it a, a political meaning that I suppose is, is palatable in contemporary Hollywood. But, you know, as, and then, you know, perhaps Saurabh, you know, looking back to your, uh, Substack post last week where you pointed out, well, there are these kind of varying other political factions, 
um, that you know are are represented here, um, and and I think we have, you know, we have one that is represented as as um, you know explicitly evil, right? Which is the the Harkonnen, um, you know, uh, faction, the Baron Harkonnen faction. Um, you know, which is represented with kind of fascist imagery straight out of sort of triumph of the will. And, and then we have these other figures who are, who are, you know, morally ambiguous in the, in the way that sort of, you know, characters in like Shakespearean tragedy are. Um, but, you know, that there is some kind of desire to find, uh, you know, a, a sort of, a resi- you know, a hashtag resistance that you can attach some sort of, you know, positive political meaning to, even though it's, as I said, I think sort of contradicted by, you know, the way the, the desert people are portrayed as being on one hand, you know, highly, highly traditional and, and hierarchical in their own way. And then on the other hand, also being, you know, highly manipulable by the, the interests of, you um, you know, larger powers, which, you know, I think kind of goes along with, uh, you know, just to bring my own work in here, um, you know, my piece about Franz Fanon, where, you know, there, you know, one thread of Fanon is this kind of desire to romanticize the rebellion of the, you know, and, and these are precisely, you know, the sort of, um, the, the sort of deep Algeria of, you know, the sort of desert uh, peasants, you know, revolting against the French state was, you know, precisely his kind of, um, you know, his major inspiration. But then, you know, th- th- there were also obvious ways that he could eventually see that, you know, these somewhat inchoate, um, you know, political formations are actually quite easily manipulated by foreign powers. Um, and so, you know, that, that so he was, he was able to see that happening as well. But I think the film doesn't quite... Um, you know, it, it sort of, uh, it, it wants to present us with this, this more sort of palatable political narrative, even though it, its own content sort of cr- contradicts that in, in various ways. And certainly the original Frank Herbert saga um, is, is largely at odds with, you know, that kind of um, sort of glossy um, sort of left-wing pablum. So anyway, those are my thoughts. I enjoyed the movie. Um, and, you know, I, I thought that what what Dengler highlights is kind of the weak spot of it, but um, overall an enjoyable uh, an enjoyable experience. And looking forward to the next installment. Yeah, I I also enjoyed it a great deal. You know, I I'm always struck by uh, Matthew's conspicuous insistence on saying that he hasn't watched Dune. It reminds me of um, when I was in high school. Uh, I I I went out to prom like senior prom with. Uh, like a girl who was like objectively like, you know, socially, physically, et cetera, much higher uh, rank than me in the high school hierarchy. And like, I don't know why, but like we went to bowling beforehand and I immediately was like, had a nerd meltdown. And I was like talking about Star Wars, which is the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do in that situation. And she was like, I haven't seen a single minute of that because she wanted to, like, there were other, we were like in, in, in like duos and, 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 you know, in front of the other girls, she's not going to, and, and there's something reminiscent of that in Matthew's refusal to say that he wants, it's like, I am too cool for like popular science fiction. Um, so I just want to register. What I'm my... hearing here is that you think I'm good looking. So thank you, Sarab. Uh, <laughs> no, there's I no other recipro- way in which that. I, full, in which, I fully no, no, reciprocate. <laughs> don't, don't put yourself in the analogy other than to say that you're too cool for, <laughs> for uh, the Frank Herbert saga. But no, in all seriousness, I thought it was really good. I, the Zen, the, the um, Zendaya thing. I read a couple of the books back, way back in the day. So I, I admit I admit I've, I've sullied, sullied myself. Um, they're good all right fair enough um but yeah i mean i uh i did notice the zendaya thing i didn't make much of it but it's it is kind of funny because at various points uh i mean just the visual imagery and if you've read the books which i've only read the first one um you know that there's like a strong hints of islam in the fremen culture you know the way they pray even the kind of the gestures etc i mean it's in space and it's a space religion but let's be honest it's like space islam and so to to have her be like but we you know man and woman we are all equal is kind of uh you know implausible and cringy but i didn't make too much of it 
what I've decided, what I've decided is, especially, especially the second Dune movie. I mean, I'm trying to think of it as a standalone, in some ways, product of or, or vision of Denis Villeneuve is that it's a movie really about about faith, and you know, it, if you look too closely at the uh, secular history of any religion, there's a kind of discomforting element where you realize, you know, how certain social conditions gave rise to a specific religion. And then, you know, how the would-be prophet or messiah of that faith was able to kind of reconfigure the community's pre-existing prophetic tradition so that he emerges as its master subject. I am the messiah who is promised to you, which is the role that Paul Atreides plays among the Fremen. And there are many other religions to which where you can point at the presence of those factors. And so for thoughtful people of faith, there is this kind of uh, nagging, kind of scary question of, of secular histories of religion that says like, well, of course, such and such a people would come to believe in such and such a messiah, given the fact that their life world was disrupted by, um, you know, a Hellenic invasion in, the, in late antiquity um, that completely sort of uh, uh, pulled out the rug from under their feet, their sense that they stand in a sort of orderly cosmos that makes sense to them. And so against those, against that backdrop, no wonder they would come up with, for example, the Gnostic cults of the, of the late antique period that told you that, you know, I actually, the cosmos itself doesn't make sense at all because it's a horrible mishap that we have a creation at all. We don't belong in this. We are a cosmic creatures and our true longing is to be, is to be to go beyond this mundane world to be trans mundane that's kind of i think the most plausible explanation of the cosmic uh, the gnostic cults of the late antique period and the, the movie here is playing around with the same ideas of why people would come to believe in a kind of voice from the outer world who would come to save them and of course it's cynically but this faith has been cynically planted among them by one of the kind of factions in the galaxy that uh that uh, Jeff alluded to. And so if you're a believer, as I am, uh, and a believer in a specific religion, you have to grapple with that. It's like, how do you know that your faith is not, you know, the result of a, is it the product of a particularly adept spiritual hustler, or entrepreneur, who, who is able to position himself as the fulfillment of prophecy? And I have good answers for that as a Christian, but it's fun to play with, to think about the movie in these, in these terms. Nina, did you see Dune? No, I did not see Dune. I am a terrible snob and I only watch art house movies from Eastern Europe as people who read my Substack every Friday <laughs> will, will, will discover if they haven't already. I was forced to go and see the first one uh, by another podcast I speak on about cinema generally. Um, and I thought it was like a perfume advert and I, I didn't like it at all. And I think people should stop wasting money on these ridiculous things. <laughs> and also, sorry, I did not watch Star Wars at high school. Uh, not because I, I was too cool. I wasn't cool at all. I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. But because there were no bloody cinemas anywhere near where I lived. And we barely had a television and it certainly wouldn't have played Star Wars. Uh, so there are other reasons why <laughs> people have watched Star Wars. But so I will admit not to being cool because I'm not, and I never was. But I am definitely a snob. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. I do have I do have June the book in my house, which I might read at some point. But that's that's all I have to say on the matter. Nina, I I do know that uh, other things have been occupying your time this week. It's a story we wanted to address on the podcast. We know our listeners demanded it. Uh, Kate Middleton the uh, Princess of Wales uh, put out a photo uh, showing her with her children. Look great, lovely family. But obviously this was subjected to intense scrutiny and uh, a lot of people pointed out that it seemed to have been obviously and crudely photoshopped. Uh, why does that matter? And kind of what, what, what's, the, what's the interest in this? I mean, who, who cares? How, how did this become so controversial? It seems to be really big. Well, Matthew, it is a huge story, and this is a story that goes back months, if not centuries. Uh, many conspiracy theories about this photograph, but it's in the context of Kate Middleton having disappeared for months on end. She apparently had an operation, and she's probably just recovering, and she's probably just tired of, you know, being photographed and wanted to spend some time like a normal person. Um, Kate Middleton, by the way, is very beloved in the UK. She's uh, very, very well-liked. She's a very kind of 
normal woman. She 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 you know she's good looking. She does her job very well. She's well dressed, obviously. She seems like a good mother. Um, but people admire her greatly. I think partly because she represents a certain kind of class aspiration. Um, and her sister has a nice ass uh, as well. So people like that. Uh, but. Yeah, so but she's disappeared for the past few months. So people have then this weird photograph came out, and it was obviously photoshopped. And recently, she said, I think yesterday, that she had photoshopped it herself, which is really strange. And her like little daughter's arm is all sort of hanging off. It's all very bizarre. And I've read some truly crazy <laughs> conspiracy theories <laughs> about this is sort of pointing back centuries to various kind of uh, royal uh, secrets. Uh, one of her children has their fingers crossed. Um, there's all kind of uh, esoteric uh, symbolism going on in the photograph. Um, I I don't know. She's not wearing her wedding ring. There's lots of speculation that she's sort of leaving the family. This is also in the context of Princess Diana um, and the whole sort of, you know, sort of murky underside of the royal family. Uh, and not to mention Meghan and Harry, who, who sort of are like apex millennial narcissists. I don't really know what's going on with them, but uh, yeah, all very odd. Um, let's just hope that everything is is well with the sovereign. Charles is doing a good job. He's recently diagnosed with cancer, but everyone's very supportive of him. Um, he is our great perennial king, uh, and we we wish all of them uh, the best. Yeah, I, I guess I just I read a couple of these stories and uh, was surprised at the. Uh, the kind of seeming seemingly very real anger uh kind of at the royal family or just anger at this photo being uh altered in some way and just the kind of expectation of an authentic photo and the real kind of uh, backlash against a doctored photo just really struck me and i i really don't fully understand the cult of the royals um which I think don't Americans share? Isn't it something that we we get to participate in too? So I, I don't know if I'm missing something no, because I'm Americans, American. No, Americans are totally obsessed. I know some Americans. Yeah. American women uh, who are lovely, great thinkers, very intelligent, who are completely obsessed with the royal family. I, okay. I'm not sure if it's because you don't have one and you're sort of jealous or something. Um, but yeah, it's like a kind of soap opera, even for really quite otherwise intelligent uh, people. I'm not, not sure what's going on there. I never had the Americans kind of uh, fetish for British royals. I never shared that. Um, maybe it's because I come from a monarchical culture. Yes, I mean, we had 2,500 years of monarchy that was overthrown, but now we basically practically have a cleric king in Iran. So maybe that's why I've never been. But when I lived in Britain, um, you know, I would run around uh, Hyde Park and, and Kensington Park and... Uh, I would occasionally see the helicopter land when the royals would come in. And what, what what was remarkable was how accessible the whole thing was. Like, yes, there was a kind of barrier you couldn't get past. But otherwise, the royals are pretty, they're just like us, as the supermarket tabloids say. Sorry, that was like the least uh, productive contribution to a compact podcast question ever. I just, <laughs> just had given zero <laughs> thought to the photoshopped blemishes. Um, sorry, forgot, forgive us listeners. We'll prep better for these really kind of really important world historic topics. You'll, you'll bring it, you'll bring it, you'll bring it next time, next week. Um, and, uh, but before, uh, we reconvene next week, watch this feed. You're soon going to have a chance to listen to the debut episode of blame theory, a uh, new podcast from Jeff Schulenberger and Nina Power. Uh, this will be totally unlike uh, the compact podcast you're listening to now, um, in that instead of the toss off comments from people who haven't watched Dune or don't know anything about the uh, Royals, uh, Jeff and Nina are going to really take you deep into a topic, sometimes speaking with a thinker who's uh, an expert in the topic at hand, um, and sometimes just working through the literature they themselves have consumed. Our debut was. Of the podcast was amazing. It was at KGB Bar in New York featuring Avital Rennell, uh, the celebrated and controversial punk theorist. And uh, you'll soon see that in your feed. Um, and to read everything we publish, go to compactmag.com. Thanks to Sarab, uh, Nina, and Jeff, and thanks to listeners. Mm-hmm.